ahead and uh, let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to, um, let's see, where do we want to go? Well, we'll start with uh, Luke chapter 22. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. So as we uh, continue in Luke chapter 22, we've been talking about uh, now the Lord's Supper as we now know it, as was instituted during the Passover Supper that our Lord celebrated in the uh, last night in which uh, he was here on planet Earth prior to his betrayal and then crucifixion. And in regard to this, uh, we've been noting uh, uh, the bread and the wine of the communion celebration, taking from the Passover celebration that included four cups of wine. They had the unleavened bread. They also had the sacrificial lamb, as it were, and uh, ate from the lamb that represented Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross. Uh, but in this great Passover celebration, as is recorded by the three writers of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see that the bread and the wine was instituted from this Passover celebration to now give us what we call the Lord's Supper, our communion celebration that is for the church. As our, light, as our Lord was the Passover lamb himself, he fulfilled the Passover. Therefore, we don't have to celebrate the Passover any longer, but we are commanded to take of the bread and the wine in memorial to what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ accomplished for us upon the cross. So that's what uh, our Lord instituted during that Passover supper. That's what we'll continue to do until his return. So in regard to this uh, uh, understanding of these passages, I am now going to focus this morning on the four cups of the Passover celebration, just to give you a little bit more information about them and really focus on the third cup that our Lord gave that is the cup called redemption the redemption cup that really is the cup that our Lord wanted us to continue to celebrate throughout the church age so again if we go back into Luke chapter 22 verses 19 and 20 it says when he had taken some bread and given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying this is my blood which is given for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. And this past week, we talked about what that new covenant is, what it meant to Israel, what it means to the church, and what it means for eternity as well for all who believe in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But in regard to this, our Lord took those four cups in this celebration, uh, again, worshiping and uh, recognizing the great plan that God the Father had for mankind and also what he would fulfill for us all upon the cross. Our Lord then took this Passover celebration, instituted from the four cups, really that third cup as I've mentioned, and gave us a new celebration to go forward with until his return. We see that again in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in regard to this, we see that uh, this celebration of Passover was given to the Israelites starting on the night that our Lord brought the last of the ten plagues uh, to Egypt where it was killing the firstborn of any household that did not have the blood of the sacrificial lamb on the lintel and the doorpost. We've talked about that too over the last week or so. And anyone who did not have that, the firstborn of the house would be killed by the angel of death who came through. And as a result of that, that was really the last straw for Pharaoh and he then allowed the Israelites to go free and in essence by the blood that was shed of those sacrificial lambs the Israelites were allowed to go free from the bondage that they had been under for 400 plus years at that time our Lord delivered them gave them freedom gave them a new nation to go forward in uh, <clears throat> and also would eventually bring them into the promised land this celebration of Passover was a memorial for the Israelites, first and foremost, to recognize and remember what God did for them during that time in bondage to give them freedom from slavery. Now it also becomes a memorial for the future as to what our Lord would have done for them by sending the Savior and the Messiah that would free them, not from the bondage of 
earthly slavery, but from the bondage of sin and the slave market of sin. Therefore, our Lord used this as a great memorial to free them from the bondage of sin, knowing that the Messiah would one day come for them and pay for their sins upon the cross. Now that that has occurred, we don't have to celebrate the entire Passover. Our Lord just takes the third cup and says, do this in remembrance of me and what he ultimately would accomplish. And then as he also said, this is the blood of the new covenant or my blood is shed for the new covenant that I am enacting with all of you. And that new covenant being that life insurance contract of spiritual life that we all receive based on the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. So in regard to that Passover celebration, those four cups were given to the people of Israel. And even during the Passover celebration, and even today, as Jews who don't believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as their Messiah, continue to celebrate the Passover, these four cups are still utilized by them in the Passover celebration and represent something fantastic in regard to the plan of God, but as we understand, which was fulfilled in the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the first cup in the celebration, we're going to go through the process of what they did during this Passover supper and how they took the cups and when they took the cups, but they had an order of the four cups. The first one talked about sanctification. And as you know, sanctified means being set apart, being made holy. And certainly God did that for the peace people of Israel. They were the chosen race. They were his people. And he brought them out of slavery and out of captivity to be his people once again in their own land, in their own nation. So he set the Israelites apart as he sets us apart when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the second cup is the cup of deliverance or salvation. He certainly delivered them from bondage and we recognize that. The third cup is redemption, the redemption cup, which which means there was a price paid for their deliverance, a price paid for their freedom from slavery. So again, he redeemed them. And again, the blood of the lamb was that signification of redeeming or purchasing Israel and their freedom from bondage from the Egyptians. As now, the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that speaks of his spiritual sacrifice is what was paid, uh, is what paid for our sins so that we could be freed from the bondage of sin forevermore. And then there's the fourth cup, which is the cup of restoration. Again, this fourth cup has many different names uh, uh, throughout time, but it also means the cup of redemption, the cup of joy, it's also called the cup of Elijah. We're going to talk more about that uh, when we get there in just a few minutes. But uh, turn in your Bibles now to Exodus chapter 6 in verses 6 through 7. <clears throat> and it's interesting that the uh, Hebrews have a book called the Mishnah. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Mishnah uh, in the past. But the Mishnah is a very interesting book in regard to the Hebrews uh, and the Israelites' religion and Judaism, even right up till today, because the Mishab, Mishnah basically was a book that was written starting with the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD, and then over the next 200 years, it was completed, and now they have a complete book called the Mishnah, and there's been some few additions to it since, but basically what that Mishnah was, was a copulation of what they called the oral laws of Israel. You see, God gave them the law, which we find in the book of Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, the book of Numbers. We see the law given by God to the people of Israel, written down for them in those books. Well, in addition to that, they had what they no thought of as the oral law, how to interpret these things. What do they mean if there's a unique situation that isn't specifically spelled out in the law? How do we interpret that and what should be the rules and responsibility in regard to that situation? Some of it had to do with worship. Some of it had to do with civilian law as we would recognize. So over the next 300 years, they wrote down that Mishnah become now the 
written law that went along with what they called the oral law that was passed down from generation to generation to generation. And because of the destruction of the temple, the dispersion of the Israelites and the Jews throughout the world, they were thinking, the rabbis of their day were thinking that we're going to lose this oral law if we do not write it down. So they wrote it down, and that's what became the Mishnah. Well, in the Mishnah, it's interesting that they point back in regard to the Passover celebration to Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. And when God gave them four cups to participate during the Passover celebration, they relate that to what it says in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And four specific verbs that are given in that passage that are promises from God as to what he will do for the people of Israel. Israel. And so in Exodus chapter 6, let's turn there in our Bibles, in verses 6 and 7, it says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, within this passage, there are four different Hebrew verbs that are given to us. First, we have the word yatsah that says, I will bring you out. So again, in verse 6 at the first part, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's the first promise. And I will bring you out, talking about the sanctification. I will set you apart from them. So therefore, in the Mishnah, they are correlating the four verbs that we see here in this passage with the four cups of the Passover celebration and then give thanks to God for what he has done for them, what he did for them in the freedom of their bondage and also in the greater spiritual sense, what God will do for them in the eternal state. Now, unfortunately, because they've rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, they're not going to receive these blessings in time nor in eternity. But for those who believe, they will receive these things in the eternal state, whether they are Jew or Gentile. And anyone who believes upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has been brought out from the human race to be a new creature, a new spiritual species, sanctified, made holy by God, entered into the family of God for all of eternity. Then we have the word natsal, which means I will deliver you. So again, in the second part of verse 6, I will deliver you from their bondage. So that's why we see the cup of deliverance, which we also could say salvation, bringing them out of that bondage and giving them freedom once again. Just as you and I have been freed from the slave market of sin, whether we're Jew or Gentile, for all who would believe. Then we have the uh, Hebrew word galal, or galal, and basically that means I will redeem. So again, redeem, redemption, that means to purchase something and then take ownership of it. So again, the redemption that was found in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is for all who would believe. And anyone who believes in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, their sins have been paid for by him upon the cross, and now they are entered into the family of God. And so therefore we see the third cup of the Passover celebration being called the Redemption Cup, recognizing that God had redeemed Israel from the slave market of, uh, of uh, uh, I- I- Egypt, taking them out of bondage, and now spiritually he has removed us from the slave market of sin. And then we have the fourth verb, which is correlated to the fourth cup, which is laka, and that basically means I will take you to be my people. So I will take you. But then he also says to be my people. And because God has now brought them back, they already were his people, but he's brought them out of the bondage and now brought them back and to be their God and to be their king. Remember, Israel was not supposed to have a king. God was their king, and he was the sovereign of that nation. And so therefore, he brought them back into that mode of operation where he would be their king. He would be, or they would be, his people. And as a result of that, because they would be the people of God once again, 
again, brought into the promised land and God's blessing upon them, they also would call this the cup of joy of Israel because now they would be God's chosen race uh, again uh, experientially once again. Even though they already were positionally, now experientially they would be his chosen people, his chosen race. They would enjoy the blessings of God. So that's why this sometimes is called the cup of joy. <clears throat> So that's when they look back to what God had done them, freeing them from the bondage of Egypt. But remember, at the same time, this not only had a past view, it had a, a future view as well. And the future view was that God would bring them into his kingdom, the eternal kingdom that he had promised them. So that's why this fourth cup, again, I will take you to be my people, not only talks about the joy of restoring them as a nation, as a people, out from the bondage of Egypt, Egypt, but also looking forward to the millennial kingdom and then eternity kingdom where they would be the a people of God in an eternal kingdom forever and ever and ever. That's why we also, they also call this the cup of Elijah because remember Elijah was prophesied to come as a forerunner before the Messiah that would enter them into the kingdom. And if you remember what that is all about, remember Jesus Christ him said, Elijah has already come. And who was Elijah? Again, basically John the Baptist. Not that Elijah was a reincarnation in John the Baptist, but John the Baptist was the forerunner, the spokesperson, crying in the wilderness that the Messiah had come. So again, they call this the Elijah cup because they don't believe even in our day and age, uh, if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, they don't believe that Elijah has come. They don't believe that the Messiah has come as of yet and are still waiting. And so therefore they're waiting for Elijah to come and uh, that will come when the kingdom of God comes. And so again, the fourth cup celebration is looking forward to that day. All right, so again, a good overview of what those four cups are and what we recognize from what God said about freeing them from the bondage of slavery of the Egyptians. And then when he did, he also gave them the Passover celebration to memorialize that, gave it to them on that uh, last night in, in the 10th plague to, again, uh, make sure that their sin or, or that they, their family members were covered from the angel of death that would come in, giving them freedom from slavery, freedom from bondage, and now going into the promised land that God had promised them. So we see that recognized here in the book of Exodus. We see it aligned up with the four cups of the Passover celebration. So when we look at the Passover celebration... There's uh, many, many analogies and typology that we could look at. And I gave you, I think, six pages of notes, if you, if you get my notes. It's about six pages of notes, but I'm skipping over a lot of that uh, today to kind of get to the meat and to the heart of all of it and really focus on the cups for us this morning. But basically, there's uh, more things, even beyond the notes that I gave you, that we could do an analogy and uh, uh, recognition of who and what Jesus Christ is in his first advent and then also what he would fulfill in his second advent. But now getting down to the brass tacks of recognizing what the Passover celebration was all about, remember that that Passover celebration first included the removal of the unleavened bread. It was also called the day of preparation because the Feast of Unleavened Bread was to be the next day. And in that day, they would remove all the leaven from their house to make sure that there was no yeast anywhere within the household. And why? It was a good representation of sin being removed by the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as they would remove the leaven on that uh, uh, first part of Passover, it was a recognition of what Christ would do for them. And as we see in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8, Jesus fulfilled this also where we have the removal of leaven from us, again, the removal of sin as a, work of, uh, as a result of his work upon the cross. Then the second thing that they would do was a ceremonial type of washing. And in fact, there were actually two types of washings that they would do, wash their hands at the first, and then they would have a second washing of their hands. But there we also see our Lord did something unique unique as John speaks in regard to his gospel because the other three gospel writers didn't write about it and that's when Jesus Christ got down and washed the feet 
of the disciples. Again, a whole study. We spent months on that. Uh, not months, but we spent a, a number of different classes on that some time ago, and we studied the Gospel of John, chapter 13. But it's a great recognition of service and sacrifice, but at the same time giving us the great example of rebound, the experiential sanctification or cleansing that is necessary to go forward in the plan of God. So they would remove the leaven, they would have a ceremonial washing, all pictures of what Jesus Christ would accomplish for them upon the cross. And then there was also, and continues to be today, a candle lighting ceremony that was also done by the woman of the household. And specifically the woman of the household lighting the candle, which was a memorial, which they don't recognize and understand, that a woman would bring the Messiah into the world. And Mary was the vessel that brought the Messiah into the world by the hands of God. So again, the light of the world, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, has come into the world by the hands of a woman. So there's a lighting of the candle in their ceremony even today to memorialize that, but yet they don't recognize that it's already happened, you know, 2,000 years ago with Mary and her virgin birth. But again, one day they will recognize, one day they will understand, and certainly during the tribulation, many Jews will come to salvation and finally realize all those things that they did during the Passover, all the things that are fulfilled or are found in the law are fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, as they spoke to that, we also see John chapter 8 in verse 12. It says, Then Jesus spoke, uh, or again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So again, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was the light that came into the world. And so then, next on that Passover celebration, during the Passover supper, they then would drink that first cup in the ceremony of the Passover. That's the cup of sanctification. That's the cup that recognized that they were set apart, no longer part of the Egyptian kingdom, now brought out as a separate entity, as a new nation, coming forward and then eventually entered into the promised land. So the cup of sanctification spoke of all of that and God bringing them out of the bondage of sin and slavery. So what we recognize also in your notes, I've given this, but I just want to read a quote from a, a website that I've uh, uh, found in the past called Chosen People Ministries, okay? So similar to a Jews to, for Jesus, but again, Chosen People Ministries. Ministries. And a quote from them, and again, this is a believing Jewish organization, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, The children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. Their tears were bitter. They started out their time as dignified guests, but with time and regime change, they became slaves. The yoke of slavery was burdensome and heavy. During Passover, they remembered how God brought the children of Israel out from slavery and made them into a great nation with a name and a great purpose. You see, Israel always has had a purpose and calling to be the light to the nations and to bring Messiah, Jesus, into the world. So again, a great uh, a Jewish believing organization and recognizing what the Passover celebration was all about and again, how Jesus Christ fulfilled those things. We also see this again in that first part of Exodus chapter 6. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. God fulfilled that for Israel thousands of years ago. Jesus Christ has fulfilled that for all who would believe upon him on the cross 2,000 years ago where we are now freed from the burden of sin and the slavery of sin. And through that work of Jesus Christ upon the cross, you and I are sanctified. Again, we are made holy. We positionally stand in the presence of God perfect and holy and absolute righteous. God does not look at us as a sinful human being any longer because we have accepted Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for our sins. And even though we can sin after our salvation and uh, therefore can not walk in that position that God has given to us, 
positionally we stand perfect and holy in righteousness and sanctified in the eyes of God. But do we walk in that every day? Absolutely not, because we sin. But God has given us a way of cleansing there as well through 1 John 1, 9, the confession of our sins. So experientially, we walk sanctified. We walk in the position that God has made us through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that in the Gospel of John, the book of Acts. We see it in 1 Corinthians. Also in the book of Hebrews, several times in regard to the work of Jesus that has given us personal sanctification. A couple of those verses that we have, starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, For such were some of you, talking about sinners, foreign and alien, not part of the people and family of God. For such were some of you, but you were washed. Notice that, you were washed. Remember Jesus did the ceremonial washing of their feet? Remember how he distinguished between nipto and luo? And he said, you've already had a bath, you don't need that. This now is just to wash your feet. He said, you've already been washed for your position in God and in Christ. You've already had a bath, you're already positionally sanctified. Now you just need to wash your feet. Experiential sanctification. But this verse in 1 Corinthians 6 is talking about that bath. We have been bathed. We've had the luo already. We've been bathed. We positionally stand washed and clean. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So we've received that washing of experiential and positional sanctification through the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, we stand justified before God. No longer do our sins keep us away from God. We stand in his presence justified because Jesus Christ did the work for us upon the cross. Then we also see in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And then in verse 14, which I don't have for you on the board, it says, For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And that's the position you stand in. You are perfect, holy, righteous, just in the eyes of God, even though we are wicked, rotten, wretched sinners, and we sin every day. It does not matter in the position that we stand in with God. It does matter in regard to our daily relationship with God, okay? It does matter there, but in regard to our position in the Lord Jesus Christ, it does not matter matter. We stand holy, righteous, and justified, and we don't have to do works to overcome our sin. Jesus has fulfilled it and accomplished all of it for us upon the cross. All right, so that's what the first cup was all about in the Passover celebration. Now, uh, the next thing that they would do in the Passover, they would eat of the bitter herbs. And you can kind of get the analogy for this and what that's all about. Why the bitter herbs, okay? Why those things? And again, uh, if any of you have ever had arugula, okay? If you pick arugula at the right time, you can eat it, and it tastes pretty good. But if you let it go a little bit long and you let it certainly go to seed, you cannot eat that stuff. It is hot as pepper and just bitter, and you just got to spit it out of your mouth, okay? So they probably had arugula on the plate at this time, okay? But again, it was a type of bitter herb that didn't taste good. And why was that? Because the bitterness of bondage and slavery is not good for anyone. It wasn't good for the Israelites when they were in the bondage of Egypt. It's not good for the unbeliever who is full of their sin. And so they would eat bitter herbs during the Passover celebration as a reminder of the bondage that they were under and the bitterness that they uh, had to endure under that bondage that now has been removed from them. As you and I have been under the bondage of sin and the slave market of sin, now we've been freed. And no longer do we have to go back to pay for our sins and work for our sins and overcome our sins or even have to live in our sins. We, cannot, we can now live without sin if we would just go forward in the plan of God and follow him. And if we do sin, we've got a way of escape very easily. The cross of Jesus Christ, name and cite that sin, 1 John 1, 9. And you're cleansed experientially once again. 
So again, they would eat bitter herbs at this time to recognize the bondage that they were under, but it also was a recognition of the bitterness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or the Messiah, and what he would endure on their behalf. That he would have to go through bitterness and the suffering that he would endure so that we would not have suffering any longer. We would not have bitterness any longer within our lives. And so we see that again in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. It says, But we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels. He took on humanity, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Again, there's no coincidence that God says taste death, okay? The bitter herbs, the tasting, it was yucky, it was lousy, it was gross, okay? It was awful. Jesus Christ endured that bitterness. He tasted that death, that spiritual separation from God the Father, the spiritual death upon the cross so that we would not have to and instead have eternal life with holiness and grace and being justified and sanctified for all of eternity. So again, the cup of sanctification, then they would eat the bitter herbs. Now they get into the second cup of the celebration, which was the cup of deliverance. And as we've noted, again, this cup is associated with that tenth plague or the, all the ten plagues of Israel, but specifically with that tenth plague that then allowed them to go free and delivered them from the bondage of slavery. It now is a cup that uh, is continued to be used in remembrance of that for the unbelieving Jew. But again, we see the analogy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he is the one that delivered us from the slave market of sin. And as it said again in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, the second part, and I will deliver you from their bondage. That was a promise by God, which he fulfilled. And it's a promise by God that we are all delivered through the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from the slave market of sin, the bondage of sin that every member of the human race is under until those chains are broken by the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. What we also recognize is that Jesus Christ was delivered over by the hands of man to be persecuted, to suffer, to die, and to be crucified. But yet, he was delivered over to suffer so that we could be saved from that slave market of sin. And we see that in the book of Acts, the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, and the book of Hebrews. It's interesting how God says, you know, delivered over, delivered over. I will deliver you, but my son has been delivered over so that you could be delivered by his work and by the person of Jesus Christ. So a couple of scriptures, as we've noted there, again, I've given you more up on the board, but uh, more in your notes as well. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, it says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. He was delivered over because of our sin. He paid for our sin, and then he was raised on the third day to resurrection glory to show that we have been justified, our sin has been paid for, and now we stand justified, holy, and sanctified before our God. As it also says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Again, the writers of the New Testament understood these things. These Jewish writers totally understood what this Passover celebration was all about and the fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It was a memorial to the physical, material deliverance of, uh, of freedom from bondage for Israel. But it spoke more volumes in regard to the spiritual freedom and the spiritual delivery that we have received through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. He suffered on the cross so that we could be free. Therefore, we are to stand firm and don't go back to the yoke of slavery. And again, that word yoke talks about bondage and slavery as the animal is yoked to do the burden of the work. Okay? We are no longer under the yoke of slavery. We're no longer under the yoke of sin. Jesus Christ has freed us from that. Don't go back to that way of life. Don't go back to that lifestyle because it does nothing but bond, bond, or oh, bind you up. Bond you up, bind you up, okay? You can say it either way, I guess. But it does nothing but that. 
It puts you right back into a place of difficulty and burden because of the sin that is in your life. We are freed from that. We have been saved from that. Therefore, we no longer have to endure that because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, there's a next section that's kind of interesting. I'll get my slide to move here, which is called the Afiko Men in the Hebrew language. And basically, this was a ritual during the Passover supper with unleavened bread. And so as we've talked about over the last week or so, they ate unleavened bread during the Passover celebration, as we see here, and as we see our Lord taking the bread and breaking it and sharing it amongst the disciples, that it still is part of our communion celebration uh, right throughout the church age. They had a part of unleavened bread during the Passover celebration that our Lord applied and utilized to now give us the new rite and ritual that we currently celebrate. But as you know, the Feast of Unleavened Bread began that next day, and for seven days they would eat unleavened bread. Again, seven, the number of spiritual perfection, talking about the perfect work of Jesus Christ in the body of Jesus Christ upon the cross. But this is kind of an interesting ritual that they even do today. And basically, just to kind of, you know, uh, simple it down for you a little bit, they have a pouch, okay? And there's three sections to that pouch. And in that, they'll have three pieces of matzah bread uh, that would be put in that pouch, okay? And what they would do is take the middle one of that, take it out, break it in half. And the bigger of the two pieces, they would wrap in linen, put it back in, and then take the other one and go hide it somewhere in the house. And then they would have this nice, fun ritual that they continue to do today where they would have uh, one of the uh, boys of the household would search the house to try to find it. And then he does, and he recovers it, and then it's brought back, and then they break it and share it, and everyone partakes and eats of it. Boy, oh boy, what a picture of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, the three breads also are a picture of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The one that's in the middle is taken out and broken as Jesus broke the bread on that night of Passover and shared it amongst everyone. The middle one was wrapped in uh, linen clothing, talking about Jesus. Once he died on the cross, what did they do with him? They wrapped him in linen cloth, and he was buried. He was hidden. He was hidden away. Oh, and then third day later, he rose from the grave. And what happened? The ladies went there, the disciples went there, and now found him gone but then he appeared to them so he was found once again just as a little boy takes that bread and finds the bread and returns it back to the family and they all share in that bread you see that middle bread that they're even celebrating today the imagery is there for them to recognize the person and work of our lord and savior jesus christ the bread alone talks about the body of jesus christ with its piercings and its bruising and the unleavened nature of it where it has no sin it is broken and separated, and everybody has to eat the flesh of Jesus Christ. It is lost, and then it is found, brought back in too. Talking about the resurrection, the burial, and also the resurrection. Again, all the imagery is there. And that was celebrated during this afikamen by them. And again, it correlates back to the book of Isaiah, and then also what John writes in John chapter 6. Again, you can read those on your own. The next thing they would do is now partake of the meal where they would eat that unleavened bread along with the lamb and some of the herbs as well that were part of the Passover celebration and are continue to be today. So again, we note the analogy there. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that was slain for our behalf, for our sins. So again, they would participate in that. And that was given the very first night that the Passover celebration was given to Israel when the 10th plague of Israel. Egypt was going into the community, and yet they were participating in this great meal, eating the lamb. A great picture of Jesus' sacrifice upon the cross. We see that also in Matthew 26, 26, in the, commu in the Passover celebration that he was enjoying. After they would eat the meal, this is interesting, after they eat the meal, now the third cup is partaken. After they ate the sacrificial lamb, after they ate the unleavened bread, talking about the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the sacrifice, now they would drink the cup. That too, as Jesus said, this represents my blood, and this is the new covenant in my blood. 
And so this third cup, which was the redemption cup, going back to the book of Exodus, I'll show you that again in just a minute, going back to the book of Exodus, the third cup, the redemption cup, where he would redeem them from the slave market of sin, or excuse me, slave market of Egypt. Now for us, the slave market of sin, the redemption cup is drank. And it's kind of a duality here where it's not only the third cup of the Passover celebration, but it's the first cup after the meal. First cup after the meal. And so again, that number one talks about unity. The number three talks about divine perfection. Numerology, numerology gets into all of this. Many, many analogies of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us and why he chose that third cup. After the lamb was eaten, after the bread was eaten. Again, eat my body, drink my blood. Now they're the drinking the blood, as it were, the spiritual sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross that speaks of his redeeming work. That's our acceptance. That's why we now drink the cup on communion Sundays and our celebrations to remember the redemption that Jesus Christ found based on his spiritual sacrifice on the cross in the payment of the penalty of our sins. So that's what it represented for Israel. Again, the shed blood through the sacrificial lamb. They had to take the blood, put it on the doorposts and the lintel. Remember, that forms the sign of the cross when you do that. The sign of the cross was on their households. The angel of death would see that sign of the cross, pass over the house, spare them. In other words, give them life. And then the next day they were freed from their bondage, and now they were God's people as a nation, autonomous once again. Now we focus on the spiritual aspects of all of this in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Exodus 6.6, 6, the third part, I will also redeem you. Notice with an outstretched hand. When you're on a cross, aren't your hands pretty stretched out? Okay. Well, the outstretched hand also speaks duality of judgment that is brought into the world. But again, plain and simple, and with great judgments. You see, God was prophesying and predicting that there would be ten plagues of Is uh, against Egypt that would give freedom to the Israelites. Again, with great judgments. But with outstretched hands and great judgments... Jesus Christ on the cross with his hand stretched out received the judgment in the payment of the penalty of our sins and the sin of every member of the human race. He was judged for our sins with outstretched arms. So again, no coincidence in the analogy and the, uh, the language that our Lord gives here so that we could see all these pictures and recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. He is our Savior. And so Jesus chose this third cup to show what his blood was all about, that it would be shed to redeem all of us from our sins. And the blood of the Pasha lamb, the Passover lamb, signifies the Father's propitiation as well. Again, when our Father looks at the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, he is propitiated, which means he's satisfied. No more work needs to be done. Jesus Christ has fulfilled all the work on the cross in the payment of the penalty for our sins. And God the Father is satisfied with that. No longer do they, they need to commit sacrifice year after year, week after week, month after month. No longer do they do that. Because Jesus Christ now is the fulfillment of all the sacrifices and the Father is satisfied with his work. So again, when we speak about this third cup, the redemption cup, and the blood of Jesus Christ, remember, it's not the literal blood as we've talked about and uh, studied over the last uh, several weeks, but it's the spiritual death upon the cross when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was suffering separation from God the Father during that time in his humanity. Remember, Jesus the Son of God did not separate from God because God cannot be separated. He's one. But the humanity of Jesus Christ, which never experienced this before, was separated my, and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that point, Jesus Christ purchased us our sin and then gave us freedom from the slave market of sin through his perfect work upon the cross. We see that in the book of Romans, chapter 3. Chapter 6 and 7, especially chapter 6, is a great uh, chapter in the book of Romans that speaks about Jesus' work on the cross to free us from the bondage of sin, his redemptive work. 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Hebrews, 1 Peter, and there's many other passages in scriptures. It's one of the major themes of the Bible, redemption. 
going back all the way into the Old Testament, coming into the New. Because Jesus Christ would be our redeeming Lord that would save us from our sins. As we recognize in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 7, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, again, His spiritual sacrifice, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. The grace of God did all of this for each and every one of them. All right, so now they've drank the third cup. The next two things that they would do in the celebration would be to sing a hymn. And we've talked about those hymns from the great halal, as they called it, Psalm chapter 113 to Psalm chapter 118. Some of those they would sing at the beginning. Then they would have the closing songs at the end. And then they would drink the cup of, or the fourth cup, the cup of completion, the cup of acceptance, also known as Elijah's cup. They would drink that fourth cup and the Passover meal would be completed. Then they could go about and do whatever they wanted in celebration. As we know, our Lord did not drink of this cup. He did not partake of this cup. And he said, I will not drink of the, this cup or the fruit of the vine until my kingdom comes. And he won't drink it again until the kingdom of God has been made effective. And so in regard to this for Israel, they would drink it as a cup of acceptance, completion, knowing that they've been freed from the slave market of sin, knowing that they've been brought out of bondage. As it says in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 6, Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. He brought them out as a people. He then had them go into the promised land. But we also recognize this as an eternal promise of the millennial kingdom and then the everlasting kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. The promise that was made to the people of Israel, fulfilled in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. But our Lord didn't drink of this cup at that time. Why? Because the sacrifice hadn't been committed yet. He hadn't fulfilled what was necessary to bring the kingdom to planet earth. And he still had to go to the cross. And once that work was completed, now the kingdom of God could be brought to the fore. But as we know the rest of the story, the Israelites rejected him. So he couldn't give them the kingdom right then and there. And he waited one generation, 40 years, to see if they would recover at, from their repentance and accept Jesus as their Savior. Yet they did not. Their hearts got even more hardened. And then God stopped their opportunity as a client nation unto God, did not deliver the kingdom to them at that point in time, and instead inserted the church age into human history. And now the church age is continuing until it is completed according to God's will and plan. And then we'll have the tribulation, the last seven years of Israel's uh, a, a dispensation. Then our Lord will return. Then he will return his kingdom. Then he will drink the cup, the fourth cup of the Passover, with his disciples. But let me just give you this. I'm kind of short on time, so I'm just going to speak to these things. I gave you a lot of detail in your notes. Isn't it interesting that when our Lord was going to the cross, he was very thirsty after all the beatings and whippings and trials he'd been through all night and now into the, into the morning time pe period. They tried to offer him wine to drink, sour wine. He refused it. He refused it. He refused it. After he completed the work on the cross, after he got finished saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was the next thing he said? I am thirsty. Now he's thirsty. He was probably thirsty for several hours before that. Okay, But he refused to drink before that. They ran. They took a sponge. They dipped it in a jar or a cup that had sour wine in it. Oh, and what was the instrument that they used to get that sour wine it was a reed of a plant called hyssop that they would use to put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel and G they brought it to jesus guess what he received that cup so when jesus christ took the sour wine on the cross it was as if he was drinking the fourth cup and then he said it is finished which we all know what that means and then he bowed his head and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
So that fourth cup, we could say, was drunk by our Lord after the work had been finished with the sacrifice and the payment of the penalty for our sins. Now the kingdom of God could come. But yet there were more signs and works to be done and death, you know, and then his burial with his resurrection to show even greater about the promises of eternal life. And then we know why he couldn't usher the kingdom in right then and there. But he will one day. And now the new covenant. Remember the new covenant in his blood? The third cup? Now because of the new covenant, he could usher in that kingdom. And it was a new contract with Israel. Even though you blew it under the conditional covenant called the Mosaic Law, I'm now giving you an unconditional covenant called the New Covenant where I will give you the kingdom for all of eternity. And you will be my people and I will be your God. And that will begin in the millennial reign because of the unconditional new covenant that God made with Israel that usurped the conditional covenant called the Mosaic Law that they blew and messed up with. So as Jesus Christ took the sour wine, he took that fourth cup that now was uh, uh, allowed for the uh, kingdom to be ushered in and the new covenant to be fulfilled. And that will be fulfilled one day. And in the eternal state, our Lord certainly will drink. And there may be a re reinstitution of the Passover celebration or some a form or variation of that in the millennial kingdom. Jesus will be drinking the fourth cup with his people and with his disciples during that time. But he probably already drank that fourth cup again when the work was finished upon the cross. Again, so that is the conclusion. And then they, again, as I said, they'd go out and sing a song, which they did sing the song, and then they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And now we see operational, uh, Operation Betrayal now coming to the fore where Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. So as we come back on Tuesday, we'll get now into the betrayal. Uh, actually happening and as they go off to the Garden of Gethsemane as well. All right, so let's uh, uh, bow in prayer there as we close today. Father, we thank you for this time. We praise you. We worship you. We glorify you. And Father, we thank you for your great work and your son's great work upon the cross and the payment of the penalty for our sins. And Father, only through him and by him are we saved or is anyone saved. And so, Father, we thank you for that. And, Father, we pray for all of those, whether they are Jew or Gentile, who have not accepted your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior, and especially the Jewish people who have not accepted, with all these imagery and pictures and visions that you've given, along with the signs and miracles and wonders of the past. We pray, Father, that they come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Messiah and the fulfillment of your promise to them. And they come to salvation as we have already. So, Father, we thank you for this time of gathering together, and we ask that you be with us in our closing portions. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, thank you very much. And if uh, Barry would want to come forward, and we'll take of our offering. All right, we have this Sunday, <coughs> excuse me, and next Sunday um, for offerings. And of course, Venmo is always open. So let us pray for our offering. Uh, Lord, we pray that you bless this offering and all that we're able to give and all of our congregation of gracial, gracious givers, that we may continue to meet our financial obligations and your word, the truth, will continue to be taught from this pulpit. Through Christ we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> 